we are really excited um, to start our third session of our Performing Water um, Zoom seminar series. And um, we are immensely glad that you can all join us again um, and are looking forward to our session on waves. So maybe just a couple of points in general about our seminar series in case you're joining us for the first time. Um, we've come up with this um, series and the associated research platform as a sort of way of exploring water as a core material, a malleable medium, and also as a site of interdisciplinarity and encounter. And um, we also wanted to just create a space to meet other researchers and artists and uh, performance makers that are working in this very rich field of water. And we've actually had a lot of really exciting feedback already. And if anybody else is uh, sort of interested further in collaborating with us and please shoot us an email. Um, so that would be very exciting. Um, and um, just to kind of just give you a, a, a sense again of who we are. Um, so we are um, four of us in total that are organizing this um, and maybe um, Camilla and Anna, if you can pin us all. I think we're good. Wait. Okay, so this is us. Um, and uh, maybe we just gonna, so basically that's um, Anna and Anne Laura. Um, who are both uh, faculty in the English department at Le Mans University. Um, and uh, Anna has an interest in the role of water in um, immigrant theater specifically and contemporary migrant theater. Um, and Anne Laura is working on um, the intersection between visual arts and water. And then there's also Camila, who um, is currently a PhD student at the Sorbonne and works on landscape theater and contemporary British drama. And me. Uh, I'm Ramona, and I'm a researcher at the Free University in Berlin, so not in France, um, uh, and I work on the interaction between digital and environmental theatre and performance. Um, all right, so that's us, and I don't know, since we've, we've kind of had a really big gap now between um, our last session, which was at some point in October, at the beginning of the fall in a way, um, and the last two sessions kind of actually quite close to each other, and now this one, and so um, we just thought we'd give you a super brief summary of what has already happened um, and before we continue into what we will be up to today. So um, currents and underwater were our first two sessions. And um, in currents, um, we began thinking about both the politics and colonial histories of water and focused on how visual art and video work um, has traced the sort of migration of people across waters and how the cultural shifts and power dynamics um, partake in this form of exchange. And we had Valerie Morrison from the Université de Bourgogne and the Irish artist and researcher, Marion Keating, that joined us for a talk and discussion about um, Keating's work. And there were also other um, visual arts work involved. And then in um, Underwater, um, we moved literally underwater and looked at underwater sculpture by Jason Vicaris Taylor and um, his collaboration with the marine biologist Helen Scales and also Al Grimay, who um, um, is running an organization called Art Change. Um, <clears throat> um, art for um, change. And um, they discussed the interconnections between environmental visual art and climate change activism as well. And the questions of land art and, and, and water. Um, and with that, we finally come to today. Um, and we are sort of making a shift here because we are moving from the realm of the visual very much that was sort of dominant in the first two session to that of the sonic. Um, and to restate or state the somewhat obvious, I guess, is waves are obviously both the waves of water breaking on the shore, as well as the sound waves that enter our ear canal and that literally kind of touch us in the act of hearing. So hearing, listening, and the entire sphere of the sonic um, become graspable to us in metaphors provided by water or through water. Um, and our most immediate and fundamental experience as we already kind of <laughs> experience in our trailer as well of water is very much one that um, exists through sounds, the raindrops falling, the waves crashing, the streams gurgling and so on and so forth. So water thus um, has become all three, a metaphor to describe sound experiences, but is also a material within sound art and a site and ecology that can um, display um, the politics of the Anthropocene. So to listen to the resonances between these different aspects of the relationship between, wa between water and sound is crucial and um, finding ways of performing water 
and um, um, and investigating um, the politics of listening um, within that sphere of kind of water and sound out performance is what we are um, going to try and do now. And um, we want to really emphasize this question of transdisciplinarity and that interconnectivity and the continuity between the human and the non-human. And so to do that, um, we've invited uh, four fabulous guests. Um, and I'm really excited that they all um, had the time to come here today and maybe we can pin them all now <clears throat> so um, that I can introduce them all. Um, and that is on the one hand uh, Tomoko Sauvage, um, who's a Japanese sound artist and musician um, <clears throat> that has um, created very unique um, um, wonderful sound art performances with hybrid instruments that combine water, ceramic bowls, and hydrophones to amplify the sort of sound collage she's creating. Um, and her musical experimentation is grounded in a sort of live performance practice that also Im uh, improvises and interacts with spatial environments. And she's an internationally acclaimed performer who has traveled very widely and presented her work, for example, at the VNA in London, recently at the Humboldt Forum in Berlin as well, or at the Roskilde Festival, to um, name only a few. Um, and then there is um, Salome Vergelin. She is a um, sound philosopher and artist who is currently a visiting professor at the University of Braunschweig, and has published very extensively on sound studies and on listening as a political practice. Um, and her books include, for example, Sonic Possible Worlds, the Political Possibility of Sound and Listening, and Listening to Noise and Silence. And Salome also uses collaborative and communal approaches in her work and performative interventions. And so her work really crosses back and forth in um, very um, um, unique and stimulating ways between theory and practice. Um, and finally, we have um, Robert Stock and Sebastian Schwiesinger, and they're working together um, at the Cultural History Department of the Humboldt University in Berlin. And Robert is a junior professor there and also a member of the Excellence Cluster Metaspectivity, Image Space Material. Um, and he has just concluded um, a bigger research project on media and participation um, and called On Demand and Entitlement. And his research is focused on cultures of knowledge and the materiality of epistemic practices. Um, and he works together with Sebastian, as I said, um, who's a doctoral researcher also in media and cultural history, and um, who studied, studied the, um, cultural history and theory, musicology, philosophy, and microeconomics as well. You'll have to explain us all about that um, at the Humboldt University and also at the Fulm University of Applied Science in Essen. Um, and he's a co-founder of the Berlin Research Network on Sonic Thinking. So, um, and together they will be presenting work on the Anthropocene Ocean and bioacoustics. And the way this is gonna work now is that um, Sebastian and Robert are gonna start and then we're gonna move through um, and have um, each um, of our guests present for about um, 15 minutes. And it's gonna be um, partially a mix of uh, presentation and performance plus presentation. And if anybody has like a really immediate question after any presentation, we'll, we're very happy to take that, um, but maybe just one or two. Um, and then we move on to the other ones and then we'll kind of open it up to a sort of round table discussion between us. And, and, and then very soon also we're like a bigger discussion with all of you because we want this to be as interactive as possible. And please feel free to use the chat throughout um, as much as you want. And um, Camila um, will check on all the, or will keep track of all the questions and comments that uh, come in there and that we can get back to when we are in, in the discussion section. And I hope that all makes sense. And um, I'm really looking forward um, to all the presentations and to, um, um, yeah, to our exchanges now. So I'll hand it over to Sebastian and Robert. Thank you very much um, to the four of you. Uh, Ramona, Camila, Anna and, and Laura uh, for this nice introduction and invitation. I'm trying to um, show you the screen that I've prepared and I hope we are there already and you can see it so we can move on with the um, yeah, with a, a content-wise, um, and it's very interesting that you said um, that um, you you ended the last session on the water, and perhaps 
we can start uh, to with uh, continuing on the water as well, but opening up not the visual, but a very, very interesting and rich sonic realm for that. It's Roberts and my turn to start this round today with a more historical perspective on the mediation and communication of underwater worlds. Although there has been a long literary history of imaginations of aquatic life, more direct access to the underwater realm has been gained by the advent of sonic technological investigations. The interest in underwater acoustics rose at the beginning of the 20th century and was boosted by military demands. The key component for this research was the development of hydrophones. Underwater microphones that could be used to detect sound signals and process them for human perception, although acoustic waves behave differently in seawater as their propagating medium. It is revealing what happened when people started to listen underwater and there are lots and lots of records, to this day even, that document what struck them most, that the oceans are not quiet. Here's a contemporary example of Robert Sieck, oceanographer and scientist at the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, shortly NOAA. You would think that the deepest part of the ocean would be one of the quietest places on Earth, yet there is almost constant noise. The ambient sound field is dominated by the sounds of earthquakes, both near and far, as well as by the distinct moans of baleen whales and perhaps the clamor of a Category 4 typhoon that just happened to pass overhead. It is a rich sounding world that hydrophones have opened up with geophonic, biophonic and anthropophonic noises to borrow the terms from acoustic ecology. They are all mixed and interacting, traveling long distances due to the increased transmission capacity of water. Immediately in history, military interests struggled with these circumstances. They needed to clean up this cacophony and transform it into an operational, into a communication space. I brought you one example which overtly documents these early difficulties of military underwater surveillance. Uh, I hope so. Yep, there we go. Hydrophones have been mainly used in World War I and II to listen for enemy vessels and submarines. These two images give you an impression of how such a working environment of a sonar operator on board looked like. The most important aspect of their training was to become able to distinguish the sounds of enemy objects from the rest of underwater sound, which required a lot of oral training comparable to musicians. I will give you an example of such an oral training from a Second World War training record that I'm thankful the uh, um, history of science um, researcher Lino Comprubi um, once showed me and tested me with. Return of Series D-16. The most important part of your job as operators of the expendable radiosonic buoy equipment is that you be able to recognize and interpret the sounds made by submarines maneuvering underwater. There is only one way for you to develop this ability, that is, to listen to such sounds and study them many, many times. This series of phonograph records has been prepared for just that purpose. Play them over and over until you become completely familiar with those particular sounds which mean a submarine. Water, you will recall, is a very good conductor of sound. As a result, it is never completely quiet underwater. So if you would like to test it for yourself, I provide you with three examples and you would have to guess which one is the submarine. First. Yeah. 
Here's the second one. And here's the third one. Just imagine there are a lot, lot more than these three. But it, to make it a bit more easy, and of course due to time constraints, um, I, w I only brought you three today. And I would not like the chat to explode, but if you can put your right answer in it, I would like to see how your guesses are. Um, but be quick, because I just lift the curtain in three, two, and People are mostly hesitating between uh, two and three, so, so there is a there is a number of guesses, and it's either two or three. Thank you. <laughs> You're quite good. The first one was um, ice flow underwater um, that has been recorded, and the second one was snapping shrimp, and the third one was the submarine. And it's very it's exactly the three of them that I brought exactly as ice flow is a geophonic sound, the sound made by the um, non-living. Um, um, surrounding snapping shrimp, a typically biophonic sound, which sounds very much mechanic, you have to say, and it's coined the loudest animal um, below, uh, below the uh, water surface. And the third one was the submarine. With this example, we have stayed within the military realm. But what I wanted to show you is that in the early days of hydroacoustics, the underwater sonic world was surprising and challenging even for military scientists and operators. Robert, you can take over. So hello there, nice to be here. Um, so I will continue this uh, kind of um, historic journey into the uh, world of uh, under, uh, underwater sounds and uh, uh, sounding waves. Um, and I will be continuing um, this uh, after World War II um, where um, the um, yeah the underwater uh, acoustic and microphone uh, arrays were um, somehow transformed in their uh, yeah function and dimension. So you can click on the next uh, slide if you would be so kind. Now, so Frank Watlington, a U.S. Navy engineer in the uh, uh, in the Bermudas um, during the Cold War. Um, was uh, listening, was one of the uh, uh, sonar technicians, and uh, he was listening for, uh, uh, in order to detect and identify Russian submarines or dynamite explosions uh, through a set of uh, hydrophones. Um, and um, at some point in the early, in the 50s, he picked up uh, unfamiliar sounds. And it was in, in 55 that he identified those sounds because he spotted some local humpback whales around the, the spot where he, where he stayed. Um, uh, about 10 years later in 67, when the material was declassified, he handed it over to um, a researcher named Roger Payne. And um, Roger Payne together with uh, um, uh, his partner, Katie Wayne, and also a uh, whale specialist, uh, Scott McVeigh, they uh, analyzed the data and, and used it um, yeah, as a, a musical record even. So they came to the conclusion that uh, these uh, whale vocalizations consist of unique patterns. And um, yeah, they termed it, they termed them uh, like songs. So, um, and what we here see is, uh, um, yeah, Frank, Wack, Frank Wettlington, uh, already a bit later in the mid 70s. And uh, I also brought you a photo of these magnetic tapes that uh, Wettlington made and uh, that are now part of, an, part of a collection at Ocean Alliance 
uh, whale song library uh, that is being um, yeah in restoration processes so i find found this quite interesting how they try to conserve these uh, early records from the 50s and, uh, and 70s and i also brought you a quote from the uh, from the later paper from mccain and mcveigh Payne and McVeigh, uh, where they described how uh, Watlington made these recordings. So he sat uh, uh, in his uh, office and was connected via a cable uh, with, with the hydrophone um, um, array of coast. And then he could, um, yeah, at least he said so that uh, he could um, uh, record the whale sounds uh, without, um, yeah disturbing uh, them. So um, we can now move to the next slide, please. Um, so what uh, uh, Roger Payne and Katie Payne did in uh, 1970, they uh, published a record called Songs of the Humpback Whale, where they put uh, audio recordings uh, that um, uh, Watlington had made. Yeah, And this uh, became a quite, um, yeah, uh, well-known and uh, popular uh, record during the uh, during the next decade. Um, so it was first uh, issued as a rather um, yeah independent publisher, and um, um, where they put uh, you see also um, a photograph of the of the booklet which was which came in Japanese and American. Um, uh, in Japanese and English, also to um, yeah to um, to engage um, buyers and listeners, um, and there was a, a huge critique on the whaling industries in the U.S. and Japan and Japan, so they urged the readers to help help stop commercial whaling, and um, so it had also uh, a big. Um, impact on the Save the Wells uh, campaign that started in the uh, in 1975. And um, yeah, it was issued by National Geographic in 1979 as a flexi disc that came with the journal. Um, and it was also part of the uh, so some excerpts of this uh, record were also included in the 1977 golden record that went aboard the Voyager spacecraft. So um, it became really popular and also um, had um, an impact on the uh, official banning of uh, industrial whaling in 82 in the US. So um, that was kind of the, uh, the popular uh, impact that this uh, record had on the um, yeah, anti-whaling um, uh, uh, movement and the environmentalist uh, agenda that came up. So that was really a, a, ch a change maker, um, a game changer in this, <laughs> sorry for the, uh, for the wording, um, in this uh, context in the 1970s for the uh, environmental activism and so on. So please, next slide. Um, on the uh, scientific agenda, uh, we have this uh, uh, quite uh, well-known piece by, um, uh, Roger Payne and Scott McVeigh that came out in 1971 in Science, um, where they um, yeah, lay out their findings and uh, methods. And um, so they write, uh, we have become aware of what we believe to be the humpback's most extraordinary feature. They emit a series of surprisingly beautiful sounds. And um, through the, um, yeah, through the, through the analysis of uh, audio, uh, of acoustic data, they managed to show that these um, whale, um, these uh, sound utterings by the whale had really a structure. You can uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, so there we can see and have a look at the, at the, um, yeah, at the transduction and uh, transformation of the data. So in the middle, you see the, um, the acoustic uh, spectrography that was um, made by the researchers. And then on the left, there is these, um, yeah, the, um, the phrases um, that then form themes and songs. So um, the, um, the visualization of these data uh, was helpful to see the, the structure of these um, so the, the systematic structure of this uh, utterings by the whale. Yeah? So um, to quote 
Spectrographic analysis shows, however, that all prolonged vocalization occur in long fixed sequences and are repeated with considerable accuracy, accuracy every few minutes. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, yeah, could you uh, just put on the, um, the, uh, the recording? Is there, can you um, turn it on? Yeah, these technicalities. So uh, what I wanted to show you is uh, was an extract of the first part of this record. And um, uh, this uh, from this quote from the album cover is quite um, uh, yeah, illuminating. So um, the sea is in most the sea in most places is alive with sound. The noises that most interfere with the humpback whale songs are the low pitched ones. And in recent years, ship traffic noise has become a constant draw of low pitched noise in the ocean, even far from shipping lanes. And there is um, there is a, an interesting part at this uh, very first song where you can hear also some detonations in the uh, in the recording, and then they decided uh, on purpose to leave these uh, parts also in this in this recording to show the uh, the under yeah the the noise in the underwater soundscapes not only the songs of the and the singing whales um, so uh, we will move now to the uh, more present although um, yeah, i can mention that already in the 1970s there were also some experiments to uh, make um, yeah um, not only these um, yeah, documentary uh, approaches to see that whales utter these systematic uh, uh, sounds and, and songs, um, but there were also artistic uh, experiments. There was uh, another um, yeah, a French record that came out from, K from Roger and Katie Payne that experimented somehow. So there was already an aesthetic shift. And there was um, a guy from uh, Greenpeace um, let me look up his name, Will E. Jackson, and he had uh, this experiments of kind of the interspecies music. So he had a um, modular synthesizer on board of, of, of this little ship and uh, tried to communicate and make music together with the whales. So that's kind of an interesting anecdote that I can, um, that I wanted to um, let you know. So uh, in, re in recent years, there's a lot of uh, discussion, um, as we already saw in the in the quote, about the anthropogenic uh, noise uh, pollution of the uh, so-called Anthropocene Ocean, and um, also in this uh, uh, respect, we um, yeah we have these encounters that I already outlined between um, <clears throat> um, between science and uh, and bioacoustics on and kind of an aesthetic approach approach on the other side and in this uh, paper here from uh, from last year um, <clears throat> by uh, Carlos Duarte and others there was also a um, sound artist taking part <clears throat> so um, um, yeah just that was uh, Jana, Jana Winderen um, so she is a um, yeah, sound artist that is um, yeah, interested in the, in the Anthropocene ocean and contributed to this uh, piece of, um, of um, uh, that appeared in science. So, and we have these headlines, a human noise is taking over the ocean soundscapes and so on. So there's really a problematization of, um, of the underwater uh, sounds Gabe, how to say so and you can go to the uh, next uh, slide to see a bit more of um, Jana Winderen so in the um, noisiest guy on the planet for instance um, which you can find on, on YouTube um, or on Bandcamp I think she uses snapping shrimp to shift to a multi-species soundscape and um, so Winderen calls listeners back to these creatures, uh, centuries now of climate change and um, the field. Um, yeah, and the oceans are becoming not only a lab for artists like herself, but also for uh, humanity, uh, which is <laughs> experimenting on its ecosystem, like uh, Stefan Helmreich um, 
an anthropologist comments on her work. So through and uh, with uh, such uh, sound works, the artists collaborate with mar marine biologists and other scientists. And um, Jana Winderen, for instance, I already mentioned it, um, collaborated with uh, these um, on this uh, science paper. And um, yeah, by re reviewing published research from the last decade, Duarte and co-authors outline how biophony uh, is overlaid by anthropoph anthropophony and how anthropogenic noise impacts marine Im animals and uh, yeah, which measures or policy frameworks might contribute to, I quote, mitigate impacts on marine animals that arise from anthropogenic noise and perturbations of soundscapes. So, and um, my last slide. Um, so accordingly in uh, Winderen's composition, um, she blends various recordings made in Greenland, Norway, Panama, USA, Brazil, that include the sounds of seals, melting ice, pilot whale echolocation, and various species, crustacean, bottlenose delphins, and humpback whales. So um, yeah, she draws attention to, um, on how these animals' uh, sounds are superimposed by motorboats, pile driving, and other human-made underwater noise. So, and yeah, I think you can have a look at, or you can, yeah, listen to it on um, on YouTube. I Perhaps it's uh, not working here. Sorry for that. I guess we're already a bit running late. Um, so um, if you allow us two more minutes, um, Camila Ramona, then I would just like to, um, yeah, try to close it. Uh, going full circle with um, just introducing another um, by by another example, um, and yes, of course we will give you all the YouTube links so that you can listen to it afterwards in a more because you know you need, you have to listen to things that things in a more decent way and not only in these tiny little bits. I guess. Um, the last example um, of an artistic accompaniment or intervention with oceanic sciences comes from Sonia Levy. In her film, For the Love of Corals, an ecology of perhaps, she followed a team of scientists in London who pioneered in the restoration of corals, indeed the first team that succeeded to induce corals to spawn under laboratory conditions. Especially in her sonic composition, she tries to bridge the laboratory and the oceanic world. Some of the features of the sonic artwork correspond to live data from the Great Barrier Reef, which of course is to productively parasitize scientific monitoring. This seems to become a more common approach in artistic, scientific or public academic partnerships, which, which was more or less the, the narration of our small talk, beginning within the realm of a more military research nexus and bringing it back to a more research and popular culture and now we're researched to um, arts bridge. So you can listen into the Arctic sounds, a sound world online through microphones and hydrophones installed at polar science stations, for example, a project on penguin which vocalization that we've come across at the Berlin Museum of Natural History provides their recordings for public music hackathons and so forth. There are more examples of such an artistic or public, let's call it productive misuse of research data. It seems that the political relevance of scientific research should be fostered by artistic or public relations. So perhaps it is politics where science and the arts meet when it comes to sound and water. Another aspect um, regarding the work of Tomoko, who comes next, I found interesting is that the aquarium was on stage in Levy's work. Could it be that another way in which underwater science and the arts meet is on a more methodological level? In order to work with an object or environment, scientific research has developed mechanism, mechanisms to establish laboratory surroundings that mimic their natural counterparts, but which are completely and meticulously controllable. This has been the key component, for example, for the Coral Project to be successful. 
For an artistic work with sound and water, I would guess, at least some kind of ap operational environment needs to be created, which is not, not necessarily mimicking natural surroundings, but in which also input and output relations, as well as ex exogenic factors, can be established and well managed for an artistic result. And with this, I would like to hand over to Tomoko and thank you all for your kind attention for our more than long introductionary remarks. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Robert and Sebastian. That was really, truly fascinating. And we will get back to it. And I almost, um, yeah, I don't really have to do another handover because um, uh, Sebastian already did it. So um, Tomoko, it's over to you and another use of hydrophones. Hello, my name is Tomoko Sauvage. Um, thank you for the introduction, very nice introduction. Um, so I'm a musician, sound artist, working on a, an instrument that I, I've been developing with using uh, uh, hydrophones, um, combined, combined with uh, uh, bowls, uh, some porcelain bowls, but also glass bowls, uh, water inside, and um, and um, I resonate these bowls uh, using different techniques, including feedback that I will I will I will be talking about, and um, also uh, sometimes water drops, water dripping system that is heating uh, uh, bowls. And, uh, and the water itself. And uh, also, I'm playing a lot with bubbles, um, which I, I, I will show you right now to start with. Um, Hi. <laughs> okay. Did did you did you hear the sound as well? Yeah. Okay. Good. Cool. 
So um, that was um, uh, bubbles uh, emitted from um, porous terracotta. So that's uh, a ceramic fired but um, angularized. So um, it's porous and it absorbs water um, by emitting bubbles, small micro bubbles that makes quite surprising sound each time. Um, it's quite uh, unpredictable. So that's why I'm calling it uh, fortune biscuit, like fortune cookies. It's like a, um, each time I, I put these um, ceramic pieces, it's like a show, they are showing, the, the bubbles are showing a new a landscape that I I'm, I was not expecting and uh, it changes totally the, the, the soundscape during my performance and um, yes so so that's that's uh, one of the elements um, which uh, um, which are which are unpredictable and um, and I also want to show you, talk about uh, a feedback, um, my feedback techniques that is uh, particular because um, I modulate uh, feedback tones with water waves. So it's like water becomes a, a, a modulator and um, well, you, you, you will see a bit of the video later, but I, I, I explain a little bit about the, the, um, the principle of um, this hydrophonic feedback technique, which is, um, so I use a, 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 an acoustic phenomenon called feedback that is kind of a loop between um, uh, the, the microphone and a speaker in the room so the microphones pick up the sound coming from the, the speakers and of course it 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 it's sent to 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 the, the 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 speakers again and the microphones taking the the, the, the sound again and it makes this uh, kind of loop that is um, um, um infinite but i have to uh, control you have to control the the the, the level um of the, the sound because it can go very violent when it's uh, very loud but if the, the 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 level is too low it stops the loop you have to uh, um, uh, you have to uh, send the, the the right amount of uh, gain to uh, sustain this loop, um, and at the same time, uh, there's a certain there's certain frequencies that resonate more than others. It's also according to the room acoustics. Um, it's quite complex because. Uh, it also depends on the the, the, the architecture of the, the room, but also the, the, the human beings or objects in the room that can interrupt this loop. If, for example, if someone is standing before the, the, the speaker, one of the speakers, then it changes the, 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 the mechanism and um, doesn't sound uh, the same. Um, in the, the, the so the particularity of, of my technique is that um, I kind of sculpt a, a mass of water by hand um, making waves to modulate the, the, the sound the frequency because the principle of this instrument is it's very simple but uh, I can uh, tune the balls uh, by the quantity of water. When there's more water, uh, the, the, the sound is more uh, uh, low, lower, and there's less water, the sound is higher. So uh, by making waves, 
the sound, the frequency also uh, waves. And so that the, it, it gives the, the it gives the, 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 so I can also attenuate the, the, this feedback frequency by, uh, by changing the, 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 the frequency by putting my, my hand to, 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 to have more water, I mean, to have the, to have, to, to have a lower sound, the lower notes. Um, so it's like a um, kind of a pitch bending uh, sound synthesis. Um, and also um, talking about tuning, um, the water evaporates all the time, of course. So the, 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 tu the tuning, the tuned notes uh, change uh, depending on the on the temperature and humidity of the space so now i will show you a video i hope it works okay So that was the, um, a concert uh, in Amsterdam, the Sonic Act uh, Festival. So yes, um, I think I think my presentation is 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 that's it. If you have a, any question, thank you, Tomoko. That was beautiful. Um, and did, are there any immediate questions for Tomoko about her process, maybe, or about any of the clips that you heard um, that you would like to ask now? Then, Hi, I would uh, have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. 
So my question to Tomoko would be, uh, why did she get interested in this type of music instead of more traditional music, for example? If there's anything that specific that uh, triggered her passion for this type of music, because for me as a, as a non-musician, for me it looks more like a research type of music than uh, just uh, doing music. So is it for a research project that she got interested in this, or is it more like she wants to bring something new to innovate the music, or what is it? Um, thank you for the question. Um, it, I come from a, a music field. I studied jazz, um, then I, I got interested in uh, Indian music via, um, via uh, American music that was, that was influenced by uh, Indian music and, and all the Eastern culture. And um, so uh, when I was studying Indian music, Hindu, uh, Hindustani music, but also Carnatic music of the South India, I, I, I encountered uh, a very special instrument called Jarataranga. It's um, um, balls of water, like, 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 like mine, but uh, without hydrophones. Um, you 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 hit the the balls with uh, sticks, and but it's the same principle. So uh, the bigger balls and more water uh, for deep uh, for the, the the lower notes and the smaller uh, less water um, uh, higher notes. And uh, I was totally mesmerized by uh, this instrument, the simplicity of of the sound, but also of the the, the the device, uh, I was totally uh, um, uh, um, fascinated, and I started to imitate it completely. And I, I also went to visit the, the master um, in South India, in, in, in Chennai, and, and he showed me, and we talked about it. And at one day I, I, I had bought a hydrophone. I, I was not coming from uh, any background of electron, electronic music or experimental music. And uh, I, I bought a hydrophone and I, it totally changed the nature of the instrument and I, I, was, I was really excited about it. So that's how I started uh, this instrument. So it's really not um, um, like scientific uh, 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 interest, but it, I was really drawn to uh, uh, the, the sound itself, the sound quality, which I've never heard before, and um, that was really just so inspiring, and it's it's been still inspiring me. Thank you. Is there another question for Demoko? Um Yes, I have a question, Ramona. Um, mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, uh, Tomoko. Um, I was uh, 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 it, it was it was wonderful. I had listened to your uh, music before on the net because I, I was so curious about you know, this this uh, type of experimental uh, music sound. Uh, uh, apparatus because it's it's really uh it's 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 uh, uh it includes uh, many dimensions um and uh i i find it really um striking the way um uh you highlight the uh materiality of sounds how how your your music um uh Exhibits or, or or unveils the physicality of of sounds, yeah. and um, I was wondering about the importance of physicality for you. Obviously, your hands are very important in creating the music. Uh, beyond the hands, I was wondering about the role of your entire body. Uh, do you conceive of your um, own posture as as a kind of you know as as being central and and do you see yourself as developing a choreography so I, i'd like to hear a bit more about that aspect thank you thank you for your question very interesting and yes totally the physicality um and uh, maybe corporeality is is 
totally um, the the my interest. Even though I I I I I'm not taught. I it's rare that I talk about it or even think about it really because I'm just searching for the sound and the the and my but but. I think it's 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 very natural to I have to think about the choreography as you say um, um, because of the, the 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 performativity of 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 the of this um, practice and with the the, the object um, in, that I manipulate on, on stage in real time. Nothing is pre-recorded uh, before, um, so uh, yes, I I cannot really uh, uh, analyze uh, to to present it well to you by words because I, I think I I do it I just do it and uh, I I I haven't thought about it very well, but. Um, um, it's it's uh, the performance is you 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 have an audience in the and that makes a a, um, a big they play a big role the audience plays a big role in the performance because they I feel them you know naturally uh, we and I think that the the there's some kind of um, moment of magic, magical moment uh, that I I, I, I I wait for during performance. You 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 have to make make it happen when you 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 when you have an audience because it's it's like a um, a connection uh, that uh, this music is 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 creating. Um, this the, the sharing the the, the energy uh, of the space of of the, the time the, as if the time was self suspended uh, the, there's a moment of kind of sus suspension uh, or, or temp temporary um, and um, it's it's this moment uh, that is very strong uh, in, in for in the performance and uh, so um, it's a physicality is 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 I I don't know how to how to to, to formulate it but um, physicality but also something non uh, visible something invisible uh, well the water is formless. I use sound and electricity, uh, which are invisible. Uh, at some point, there's there's something very very mysterious happening, because you don't see it very well. Uh, you, you, sometimes you have problem like in sound, and you don't know what's going on. There's a there's a uh, well. The history of electricity is not so long, uh, and. Um, and um, the installation of electricity in the building in certain buildings, you 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 don't know really uh, where's the electricity, and it penetrates the body, and the sound penetrates the body. Uh, I think it bi vibrates the, the, the bones, and especially feedback uh, is something that you um, hear with bones. That that's what I I, I think. So there's something. Um, you cannot really explain. I mean, this this is all scientific, but there's some there's many things that you cannot really explain. Um, you cannot really see, visualize, and and um, make into words um, untranslatable to 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 the words. So yeah, that's 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 what that's my answer. I don't know if it, if it was a good answer, but. Thank you. Tomoko. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Fascinating. Thank you.
So we will um, we'll move now on. And um, I know there are other questions in the um, chat, but we will come back to those later in the discussion. So, um, but thank you to Moko again. And I will um, now hand over to Salome, um, who um, will um, give this yet another sort of shift in perspective, um, but kind of pick up, I think, on a lot of the things that Tomoko was um, exploring in terms of really a sort of also shift of consciousness and shift of um, um, kind of sensibility about how we know and we interact when we are kind of working with um, sound. So um, thank you so much for being here, Salome, and um, we really look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramona um, and the whole Performing Water team. I'm just quickly going to share my screen. I swim. I feel more adept in water than on land. I move, maybe even elegantly, but certainly powerfully and fast in long strokes and strong strokes. This is not moving through, but with water. We move each other entangled, porous, reciprocal, not as form, but as formless movement, making waves. What to do if I want to keep this formless form that I experience in swimming? How to bring it on land with me? To make this watery sphere my life world, my experiential phenomenological world in which I meet you? And how to bring this, this as a watery sensibility into my everyday, into the home, into the work, to the gallery, to the museum, um, to the concert hall, to everywhere I go? to experience this dense and indivisible connectedness as what, we as what carries us and what we carry with us from more, more, for a more watery world. I'm thinking of, for example, of a critical water gymnastics as a way to make a sense the strain of moving in dense materiality. This movement that you can see sometimes in a pool where people to often to music, move their legs and arms under water and fight with the density of the materiality of the, of the medium that they're in so that they feel entangled that, and that they train to become a fish again. I, I find this possibility to enter a watery world also in sound. That is not the sound of, but is sound as itself. And as what defines us together, not in space, but as in an encounter, that just like water creates a voluminous dimensionality of everything it is with. Nothing is erased, nothing charted out on lines, cartographed, lexicalized, differentiated, and taxonomized. Instead, we get a plural sense of the invisible indivisibility of existence as a voluminous dimensionality. So water and sound together present a cosmos of interbeing where we inter are as fleshly and material bodies as human and modern humans and where we are revealed as living together. I experienced this most clearly in a swimming pool on a busy Wednesday afternoon, where there are children screaming, lifeguards using their whistles, water splashing against tiled walls, and everything together becomes an undistinguishable volume, a voluminous dimensionality in which I am, that we see, that we cannot see, that we can experience, and where vision loses its viability and center and the scene, its singular reflection, to come an invisible density and expands that we feel more on our skin than we actually see it or even hear it. It triggers a sort of expanded listening, expanded listening to ourselves with others. This volume is not created by the architectural infrastructure, by walls, windows, floors, ceilings, water, bodies, voices, but by their interaction by how they reverberate together, 
That it, thus, it is not a measure of decibels, it's not a volume as decibels, but the expanse of sound as the embodiment of the formless, as an indivisible mass that reminds us of how we are together as into beings, codependent, connected, and never alone. And so when I clap, you don't hear this hand or that hand, and you don't even just hear the sound they made together, but you hear everything that in this room reverberates and vibrates with that motion of clapping. And I believe it's probably too complicated to switch on all the mics right now, but I would very much like that you would do this yourself wherever you are. I mean, it would have been lovely, of course, if we were together in a, say, in, in a room and we would all clap at the same time. And we could really hear this being together as if we were doing water gymnastics or as if we were being in this swimming pool on a Wednesday afternoon. But if you humor me and with me to the count of three, we all clap. One, two, three. For some of you, I heard, which is nice. Maybe we could have tried with a clap to kind of see what is the reverberation of the online space. What, what is the volume of the digital? But this is the kind of the sound, the clap as entanglement with myself and with everything around me, where I can hear myself with everything in my interactions, and it becomes a metaphor and it becomes an allegory of this a watery world of a world where we are together that is a sonic world. So water and sound are a means to get us to this imagination of the indivisible, of the codependent, of the interbeing, to get us to the sensibility and design of a world not as visible and mapped, and as one of bodies not as individuated and contained, contained within our skins, but rather as a sensory indivisibility where things are in a moment of their being with, expansive, formless, and purposefully uncertain because they have lost their certain form but gained an expanse with others. In this sense, our clapping, as well as the water gymnastics, is political, since it performs an entrainment in the politics of indivisibility. It creates a governance of things together rather than apart and ushers in the sensorial governance of a sonic cosmos that as a watery world is always close up and brings with it the criticality not of distance and objectivity, which is what we normally associate with criticality and with objective thinking and with scientific thinking, but instead what it proposes is the criticality of proximity, of being close up, where reason is sensorial, close up on my body, intimate, and I do not find comprehension, as in grasping the whole, I cannot grasp it, I cannot catch it, because I myself are part of it, in that water, doing my gymnastics. And where instead I come to a tacit sense, a felt sense, and I too am grasped in that tacit tacicity from being with, where tacit knowledge is not a human knowledge only, but a knowledge of touch as a reciprocal act, where we can grasp a sonic cosmopolitanism, not only of a human politics, a human cosmopolitanism, but of human and more than human things. So thus it is a politics of waters, of ripples and waves taking shape, losing shape. Um, somebody's got a mic on. I'd be really glad if they wouldn't mind um, checking it out and, and closing it, because I have already my daughter in my ear on that side. And because we live in a sonic cosmos, I can hear her and she can hear me. And it becomes quite difficult, um, which is also obviously exactly the politics of differentiation that I'm experiencing at this very moment, which is also exciting because I have to think of the connections, the connection between my voice and, and the voice we've just heard and the voice I hear in this room as a politics of waters and ripples and waves taking shape losing shape and transforming, being always in transformation all the time and demanding that we sense things differently and that we sense ourselves differently, always in the encounter, always in connection from our response. And that also brings with it a responsibility because we're not at a distance and also that we make things responsible in the sense of granting it the ability to respond in its own voice.
a work that I have found very inspiring to that effect and how it takes on, I feel through the water, also of course more than the water, but through the water we can think that work as a political work or in its politicness. This is a fountain by Cara Walker, um, Fons Americanos, um, which was exhibited as you can see here in the Tate Modern Turbine Hall. The Tate Modern is this um, big museum in London which has a turbine hall and every so often the Huandai Commission commissions a big piece that goes in there into this whole hall. It is a fountain, it is a fountain that we very often see in France, in, in Germany and in England, and it was inspired, this particular one, by the Queen Victoria Memorial Fountain that stands outside Buckingham Palace, as Cara Walker was on another visit driving to the airport, so she says. These fountains are normally empirical sculptures that celebrate colonial power, that have some sort of heroic men mostly on them, and then they have the ripple of water as the kind of metaphor of expanse and of the colonial of water that I think we also need to take care of, where the seas are not connecting and are not making a um, cosmo, a cosmos, a sonic cosmo, cosmopolitanism of the world, but where the sea is something we have to go across in order to grab that country, in order to settle, in order to, um, in order to have that land. So the sea is seen as a separation that we have to overcome, rather than as a continuation or a being with. And this is what I feel, amongst other things, this fountain for me responds to as it guides us mainly through that water as to go round and round. I very much felt the urge to walk around these fountains, to enter into the rippling water, to enter into again this very reverberating hall that was almost like the swimming pool on the Wednesday afternoon, where I could appreciate the water as a sphere I was in, a sphere I was complicit in, in the colonial, as well as in the material density. And that I had to rethink through that. For Cara Walker, Fronts Americanos is an allegory of the Black Atlantic and really all global water, which disastrously connect Africa to America, Europe and economic prosperity, and therefore to the exploitation, to slavery, to colonialism. That is a very different water, as I said, a water that um, talks of distance and objectivity and European hegemony and rationality and the water that has to be crossed rather that has to be in, where we have to be in the water and do our political water gymnastics. And that's also where the water, where we can be very positive about what it enables, a water and of sound of a sonic world and a watery world. But this watery world also brings us to a narrative of drowning, of despair and of hopelessness. Um, that I also want to bring in very briefly to the work of Anna Raimondo, Mediterraneo. These are the stills. Unfortunately, I can't play you the video, but I can tell you, you stand in this um, room on a big screen and this glass gets dripped full, drip by drip by drip. Um, of this is very, very blue water, while Anna Raimondo says again and again, Mediterraneo, 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 until she can't speak anymore because her own voice is drowning. Her own voice is not able to speak the word Mediterraneo anymore, which brings us exactly, I feel, to that point where the water is still a conscious, while the water is a consciousness that binds and that is open, that can make, help us imagine the inclusive and the formless that is full of promise for a formless connected body that is not any more contained in its own individuality that finds a different validity and a different viability. It also presents a grave, the Mediterranean particularly, but also obviously the Atlantic and um, to slavery times presents a grave. It presents a grave of, 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 of not being able to breathe, of not being able to, to be in that water. We are still, we are not equipped to live in water. Our lungs belie the desire for proximity and transgression, and we cannot really enter the utopia of a watery world. And that's where I stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sonali. Um, that was... Um, it's such a great way of sort of bringing a lot of the themes together that um, already resonated in the other talks or that already came up in the other talks that are now are resonating back. So um, thank you everyone for your presentations. Um, we now have about, I would say 20 minutes to um, discuss and then bring in everybody else as well. 
Um, and I'm really interested actually in how you uh, are responding in a way to each other and to each other's work, which comes from really different angles, but in a way also has a great um, kind of overlap and um, shared space. And I actually wanted to ask a question at the beginning, maybe um, to all three of you or four of you um, about um, the idea. So Salome really stressed this idea now of the connectedness, right? And of the, you know, ability to really think differently, not through subject and object and individuation, but really in a sort of interconnectedness um, of, uh, of all the sort of beings and objects in a particular environment. And I was wondering, how does this work when we are thinking about the sound pollution that we heard of with um, Sebastian and um, Robert at the beginning. So we have these examples um, of, um, of also how um, noise and sound pollution are sort of coming in. And I was wondering for Tomoko, how much do you play with that sort of element of sound pollution as well? And how does this sort of um, amazing cosmopolitan and um, and sort of the opening and this kind of vision, utopian vision of sound that you've given us, Salome, sort of then kind of integrate the idea of noise and sound pollution. Um, anybody would like to start on that? Maybe Tomoko, do you use, I mean, is there something that can be a polluting sound in your performances or does that not necessarily exist, that sort of hierarchy between a wanted and an unwanted sound? Um, it's a, it's an interesting question. Um, I would say that uh, I don't have a kind of hierarchy in sound. All the sound is can be musical. Um, you know, like there there are kind of there's there's sound that is um, par parasite sound coming from, for example, outside like car noise from the street when I'm playing of course you know like um, or you know the, the noise that is made that that is normally um, um, and not 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 desired but you know when I started to play with feedback the feedback itself is normally considered to be unwanted you know you 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 are supposed to 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 uh it it, it should it shouldn't happen you know it's a, it's an undesired sound it's noise um so you know like in 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 the beginning i was trying to avoid uh uh, uh the, the feedback by actually it's all about separation uh you you uh you cut certain frequencies on the on the um, on the mixer, or you separate the the room acoustic with you know like curtains or um, any any material that can cut the sound uh, between the the stage and the and the and the audience room. But at at some point, I thought it was super beautiful. And I, I I I started to play with it, and it was just super fascinating, and it was it was just opposite to 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 the separation. It's all about all about all about connection, because this the 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 I needed then I I started to need the 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 room acoustic that is more uh, shared and connected. I had to, I had to hear the same sound with the audience, and you know, not like a stage which has its own uh, uh, sound system, and uh, the, the 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 in the audience, uh, um, the, the the speakers are targeting the audience. Um, I I I needed uh, uh, the resonance of the, the the space that that connects all the all the sound. Um, so. Um, so I don't know if if I'm I'm answering to your question, uh, yeah. but uh, but um, but uh, uh, and also so th the first of all I don't know what is polluted, what is not, uh, because we ourselves are our pollution, right? We are we ourselves are the original pollution. So uh, 
all the sound, maybe maybe all the music I I I produce is maybe a pollution. <laughs> maybe I mean, what is pollution? And also, of course, I don't consider music uh, uh, as something to advocate uh, uh, something, right? Music is just music, and uh, and people can have whole freedom to 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 receive it or not. You know, like I I I yeah. So that's that's my answer. Thank you. What about Robert and I was Sebastian and Salome? I mean, like Robert and Sebastian, you had this example really of um, um, you know anthropogenic sounds that are sort of interfering with um, the sort of um, animal world underwater and um, and that are kind of another way of colonization that Salome was talking about um, as well. So. How do you, either of you, um, kind of situate this idea of pollution? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Let 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 me also. I, I find it first of all. I would like just to quickly respond to the idea or, or notion of feedback, which mm -hmm. I find quite interesting. Also in the idea of pollution, I guess because um, feedback is not only is something which is not wanted. But in the history of science or scientific research, feedback is also something which like a control mechanism, right? You send in some information, you ping a system and then you get a response of the system which gives you information. It's like if you use, if, as an example, active sonar, for example, like it's sending out pings of sound and looking what's reflected and coming back, which gives you an idea how the environment looks like and feedback mechanism also like I don't know what the, the English word for Fliehkraftregler is. Um, it's also like a system, you know, in, in thermodynamics, which is used in order that systems can um, automatically um, feed or not, not feed, um, regulate themselves in order not to excel or being too, you know, like like uh, um, machines not really going out of their, their their regular circles, right? So this is a very interesting notion to have feedback as something which in the yeah like in room acoustics for example is something that you don't want but if it makes just me it, it just made me think about what is pollution is always depending on the idea or in 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 in, in let's say in environmental terms it's always depending on an idea of a system because what is pollution is there referred to what is a signal and what is noise right so if you have pollution, it always means that you're drowning a signal in noise, which means that the humpback whales cannot communicate anymore because there's too much sound or noise of vessels. And if you have like a sonar ping, which is for you something which gives you a signal, which gives you information about the environment, is for a humpback whale a noise which makes him disoriented and no longer being able. It's like if you also sent down like um, sound bombs in order to find out is it below the ocean surface, is there oil or something else which we could make use of as humans, is also something which is heavily um, disturbing um, the acoustic zone or the sonosphere of the uh, bioacoustic sonosphere of um, marine inhabitants. And so the, the idea of what is pollution brings us always back to the question who is in charge of the perspective, right? If we judge, for example, the ocean as a communicative system in which also the animals must be able to communicate, we're still sticking to a very anthropocentric view of the ocean. And it, it seems like it's very, as Salomo has said, it's very hard for us humans, let me call it that way, it's very hard for us humans to sit, just sit there and listen and not being all, always, always interpreting things and networks as systems with meanings and stuff. It's very hard for us just to sit there and let things happen and not being the person or, the pos uh, or filling the position where we insult meaning on the things that we are just perceiving. And I thought this is perhaps something where we're also, where, where the, the three or four of us or the three perspectives are more can be interlinked as well. 
but I'm not quite sure if this answers any of this. If, if but Tomoko, you were heavily nodding. <laughs> May I, I can just quickly add, I completely am, um, Sebastian, I'm in agreement with you that, of course, from a biodiversity and from an ecological perspective in relation to sort of um, underwater pollution in terms of animals, of course, uh, there is, you know, we can maybe talk about the pollution and we can talk about what is disorientating for animals. Uh, and and where we should maybe just sort of yeah you know, because why we make that sound is again in a colonial settler sort of mentality of we want a knowledge that we can grasp and grab and have for us it is about what we want and it is a it is a very um you know it reflects on a, a, an american stroke european sense of science and scientism and universality and what we need to know However, I think there is, an, is another part to it, and, and this is something that has recently been reconsidered. The acoustic ecology movement, for example, started or started, you know, historically started. I think we always have to look at the, the plural positions of history, and there are other starting points, but one seminal position that gets um, taught is R. Murray Schaffer and his notion of acoustic ecology. And he um, actually, you know, I, I actually do not refer to him very much anymore because I really feel he's been shown to have extreme oh, ideologies in his notion of good sound and bad sound, lo-fi and hi-fi, which also bordered on the racist and exactly the settler mentality um, uh, in Canada of, oh, I can't hear this because this is uh, famously, um, Dylan Robinson quotes him in his book, Hungry Listening, I can't hear um, Inuit throat singing. He doesn't even call it Inuit, he called it Eskimo throat singing because it's just so awful. Yeah, and it's, and it's really dangerous I think we have to just always be on our toes when we talk about pollution in that sense, or maybe in a philosophical, philosophical sense, in a, um, or in an artistic sense, because then the, the disorientation also becomes a, an ideological and a political orientation and how we orientate it in the world. And obviously everything that doesn't fit in with my normative orientation becomes noise becomes unusable to my knowledge schemes, becomes unthinkable and unfeelable, and therefore it is noise. Or, and, and I think that's where we, um, and I'm not saying you're not, I think you're doing that, um, Sebastian, so this is not, this is just something I wanted to add, that I think disorientation can be something extremely positive as well, uh, when we purposefully disorientate ourselves in order to become aware of our normative listening and, um, and, and understand that noise and silence are lines we draw along canonic chronological historical preferences and biases yeah uh, i also would, uh, just to jump in very quickly i i would stress this point uh, as you um, mentioned and salome um, found very um yeah important even though it it did not came up in in my um in my presentation that um I mean, uh, we would have to look uh, very carefully at uh, how this notion of pollution is uh, is um, yeah supports the argument of these um, these papers and and um, how it makes use of this. Um, I was also wondering about this of, uh, of these notion that goes back to the acoustic ecology movement of the bios uh, biophony and of the anthropo. So these are very schematic um, categories that uh, position uh, natural against uh, um, civilized soundscapes. And um, yeah, I would uh, certainly subscribe to this, that uh, we have to be careful with, uh, with these uh, notions that go back to the uh, acoustic ecology uh, movement. And um, I was uh, um, yeah, struck only just to mention two, uh, two moments of, of your presentations to Moko and Salome. So I like this idea of the, um, of the reciprocal movement and this watery sensibility and the, um, also your allusion to this um, connected uh, sonic space, which we all live in. And there we would have to, to uh, think um, when we uh, also uh, take uh, the feedback into account of how uh, animals uh, um, or non-human animals uh, react to um, um, noises made by ships and other uh, non-human entities. So perhaps birds change their pitch, whale songs move to different frequencies or so. So that would also be interesting to, um, to see uh, while also um, it is important to 
perhaps we could think about the the so-called silence uh, during the um, or reduction of uh, of noises uh, underwater during the lockdown uh, periods uh, in the corona pandemic for instance um, so just to bring up uh, a few thoughts in a very associative manner <laughs> thank you Ah, one thing, one thing I would really like to add is um, this, um, I, I'm not sure if you know, Michael Re or Michel Ridolfi was a performance artist. And I was remembered of him when you were speaking about the um, Salome, when you're mentioning the, um, the swimming pool, because he is an artist that made these underwater sounds and experimentation with, with music in the 1970s. And he has this wonderful quote, um, I have it here, just uh, read it out for you. Water materializes sound, thickens it, makes it palpable and penetrable. Water sound uh, combined, water and sound together, water and sound combined together at the molecular level, create a sonic and fluid substance that can be appreciated not only by looking at its surface reflections, but by sinking oneself into its volume, density, warmth and vibrations. So for this related somehow to your um, yeah, idea and concept of um, reciprocal movement and yeah, being with water or becoming with water. Maybe I can add or Ramona, do you want to pose another question? I see Anna. I, I have a question, but I think you should ask first. I think it's I, much better if this work organically. Okay, that's cool. No, because because I just wanted to to support Salome, what, what you were saying. Exactly. I, what, what I wanted to make the like point the finger to was that pollution and noise are uh, can are, are power notions, right? They can offer us an insight into the power relations that lay behind them. And I find just just as a quick remark, I find one book very, very exciting, which just came out last year. It's called Pollution is Colonialism, which is really reflecting on how, how colonialism or pol such, such notions like pollution are set in a scientific framework, which has is deeply colonialistically rooted, right? So there is this kind of what, what we in our talk, we're already like um, criticizing or, or just like putting it on, on the table is already starting in the sciences to become like an, an, a, th a theme, a topic to reflect on while you are doing science in order to like, yeah, and the question if you, if you can step out, but at least reflect on your positioning while you are doing natural sciences or applied sciences as not something like universally as not something like there is one pollution and this this means that and i think that lots of this anthropocene discussion has brought us as you said like disorientate disorienting ourselves by stepping away from we as humans position of interpreting but i guess it's still a long way to go there it's not it's just the first steps thank you sebastian um i, I was actually like wondering connected with this so one of the other things that really struck me about how these um different talks connect is that in a way in each of your talks there's a sort of um an unknown world that sort of opens up, right? For the scientists, they're suddenly baffled by hearing these sounds underwater where they thought there was stillness, you know? In Salome's watery world, there is um, a sort of different kinds of consciousness that we can gain in the world, but also a different kind of politics that, um, that arises out of the connectedness. And for Tomoko, there is this sort of laboratory with water in a way that um, that's happening and that uh, as you were saying in the um, um, in the answer to one of the questions sort of then connect to um, you know create trying to create a moment where somehow all of this sort of comes together and one feels each other in a way so I'm just and I think that's really beautiful and I'm really interested to hear more about that um, this or what do you think about the idea of a sort of unknown world that opens up through sound and whether the passageway to that um, these sort of um, new spheres or, or worlds that we are discovering there or that we are experiencing there maybe is a better word um, 
isn't technology the tool that gets us there in a way? I mean, is sound study something that really, on a, in a way, rises through the sort of, um, you know, technology plays a really important role in in, in your art and um, also in your research, uh, Robert and um, um, and Sebastian. So I'm wondering, how do you see the connection between the two in a way? Or... Uh, I thought you asking all of us, right? I'm asking all of you, but you know, anybody can start. Feel free to start something. <laughs> it's just my, I mean, my experience of working with scientists, and I'm, 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 I, I like to do that, but it takes an awful lot of work. It takes an awful lot of taking care of them to make them feel comfortable, because and I think that is also why for me, sound um, is 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 um, is one way of of, of helping us to decolon to decoloniality because sound is always disorganized and disorderly and it doesn't allow us the same taxonomical thinking it doesn't allow us the same lines that we've drawn in a visual um, sense since enlightenment um, where we've ever more looked for an objective a mechanical objectivity that could lead us to this objective ideality of we know the world is here and it's a transcendental knowledge and we come to know it, but more in it, no, it is actually all very contingent and we come to know it because we generate it as much as we come to know it. And I, I feel there is this, always this discrepancy between people and ourselves. I mean, I think we get, we get colonialized the moment we step into a primary school or into kindergarten because we get pushed underneath this kind of one knowledge frame, this one hegemonic universalizing knowledge frame. And, and it's a real fight to get out under it and to realize that the only people we can decolonialize are ourselves, um, essentially. Otherwise we have a, an extension of coloniality going on. Um, but I, I, but where I want to get at with that is that sound always troubles. Sound is that trouble that Donna Haraway talks about, and it is the problem that um, somebody like um, Bonaventura Ndikung talks about in relation to race. It is always the problem, and it has to stay the problem because once it's not the problem anymore, then it is either um, contained in musical language or in the semantic. It is only then when sound is a problem, when sound is a problem for funders to sort of think, oh, man, but that we don't get it. Or when it's a problem for disciplines, oh, no, this is too interdisciplinary, we can't cope with that. That's when sound is at its is strong, because it is then it is sound, when it is troubling what we thought we knew, and when we thought we knew how to work in a particular discipline, be that science or the humanities or the arts. I think it's always, we have disciplinary lines, and sound troubles them, and sound makes them difficult and disorganizes them. And I think that's why what I find is the excitement or the real radical potential and capacity of sound to make us rethink, but it is also why it is still excluded, why it is still that thing that, you know, we can do a bit of sound art and sort of, you know, do a bit of sonification at the end of a scientific project and make it all sound pretty. We can use it to maybe, you know, um, appease the mayor of Geneva about CERN and the whole everything that's going on have a few nice compositions but it is not sonic thinking the sonic thinking is the troubling that would I think get us to that other world thank you um if the other two if you want to um jump in feel free otherwise I also am keen to open up to um to the rest of the room because there's there's lots of questions in the chat and I don't know Kimala do you have some or somebody who has an immediate question or is somebody an, a question that we can pick up on from the chat that has already been posed and that we should start we are very good at answering the questions in the chat um, as soon as they pop up. But um, uh, Christa, uh, no, Carolyn, Carolyn Wilkins, maybe you would like to ask, are you still here with us, Carolyn? Maybe you'd like to ask a question to Tomoko about different uh, musical traditions that she's referring to. No, oh, apparently Carolyn cannot hear me. So the question was about um, this um, instrument from 1930s, uh, Termin, you know, Termin, Termin Vox, where you play with your hands. Um, like, uh, do you know about this instrument and uh, were, you, were you thinking about it? Um, yes, sure. I know, I know Termin, but, uh, and uh, many people 
uh, 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 refer to that that instrument when talking about uh, uh, my hand manipulation with water. Um, yeah, uh, I don't have much else to say about uh, uh, theramine, but uh, yeah, maybe Sebastian and uh, Robert, maybe you know more about theramine. But also, I, I wanted to talk, uh, I, I say a little bit about the uh, technology uh, when Ramona uh, talked about it. Um, the, uh, the the relationship with with technology and it's it's for me um, maybe I mean I've 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 been thinking about uh, about it as um, I think that the uh, you know the ceramics is also technology I mean you know it was a so it's and what I'm doing uh, technologically. It's it's nothing advanced, right? It's it's very basic, um, but it's also how you use your your hands with this technology, um, the, the 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 craft, how you craft uh, uh, the sound uh, using this technology, uh, ceramics, um, microphones, amplifications. Um, I also use some electronics like computer to modify. Uh, a sound um, um, and um, and uh, I artistically I think it's uh, interesting when uh, it's most interesting when you don't really recognize what's 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 there what's what's the technology used um, and it's all about uh, balance uh, between the, the balance of the, the dose, uh, the, the quantity, uh, how of of the, the technology uh, you you're using, um, it's like blurring. Um, you can use a little bit, and then it can be effective. Um, I mean, I'm I'm talking arti purely artistically, but I like the idea of trompe oreille. Trompe l'oreille, it's like trompe l'oreille, mais trompe l'oreille. Um, so like you hear something, but you don't really know what it is. Like you thought you had something, but it's you don't know. Uh, so yeah, that's my. Thank you, Tomoko. In fact, there was a number of admirative um, comments in the chat saying that like it's it's not evident to understand where does the sound come from the source of the sound. Yeah. I think Anna, Anna had a question. Um, Anna? How did you want to ask your question? Did you say Anna? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, I'll go. Um, so thanks to all of you. Um, anyone is welcome to um, respond, but I, I think my question refers to uh, more of Salome's larger work um, on these questions. I mean, one thing that's been troubling me a lot uh, recently as um, we're working on this project is, as I'm sure all of you know, a lot of work is being done either in reality or creatively imagining um, to, so that bodies of water obtain um, uh, a voice, obtain a hearing before courts of law and then thus can be recognized as entities with rights. And I'm wondering, um, which is the more urgent task? Is it to, to labor towards this recognition as entity or rather to work towards a world that rejects entities in favor of relationality? So I have, I have an ethical conflict in my own um, yeah, task, which, which anyone have answers to that? I think I think it is a, it is an interesting ethical conundrum, because obviously as soon as we talk about entities, it is it is an effort of putting something that is non-containable, something that is formless, into the schemata of 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 the formed, and and giving it therefore clarity and visibility and the name, and obviously that gives us a sort of short-term 
a short-term visibility and a short-term justification, I'd be very careful about that. It very much reminds me on the discussion of, if anybody interested in sound art, between Christoph Cox and Seth Kim Cohen on the idea of, of sound art and, and Seth Kim Cohen arguing, oh, sound art just has to behave more like conceptual art so we can fit it into theory and theorizing as it exists in, in the Western philosophy. And Christoph Cox saying, no, actually, that, you know, um, the problem is not with sound art, it is with theory, it is with how we theorize since the Platonic age, um, that we create entities, that we create things that we understand in relation to, um, to um, ideality and that we, we under understand, as he calls it, in a provincial chauvinistic frame. And I'm glad he says that, you know, I, I feel that is that is my problem. And obviously my, my inclination as an artist and as, a, as, a, as thinking philosophically would be to go, no, if we go, if we continue with the notion of we need to acknowledge entities, there is always something that cannot be an entity that remains transforming, that remains ephemeral, that remains in Visible that we exclude, so we never actually work on the principle of exclusion. So I would, I, I would actually go in favor of um, get rid of the entity notion. Okay, thank you. Maybe sort of um, um, jumping, um, you know, on top of that or, or adding to that. Um, you know, um, Salome, you said like, um, you know, sound is troubling and um, ultimately what we are really asking for is to really reconceptualize how we um, structure our thinking and how knowledge actually operates. And so my question would be, how would you then, for example, um, reorganize um, the sense of a university or, or of disciplines? How would you uh, and what role would sound play in that? This is a super interesting question, <laughs> as at the moment I'm in Germany, and Germany is more interdiscipline than every country I've ever met, maybe with the exclusion of France, actually. Um, it's very, very discipline driven, like you really become your discipline and you have to stay within your discipline in order to be visible, in order to be um, yeah, for because it is still based on a, on, a, on a truth, on a truth that is available and on a, on a disciplinary canon and, and foundation that's available. And obviously that is super difficult because that means that everything you do now has to be referenced in the past, has to be referenced through history. And the problem is, of course, if as a woman, for example, or as a non-white person, you're not represented in history, how do you ever make your knowledge count? if that is the frame of, of evidence and reference goes into the past, which is problematic, maybe in the sciences, the frame of reference is slightly different. I'm talking about the arts and humanities frame of reference, which always has to bring out certain names and certain texts in order to be um, believable, in order to have credibility and legitimacy. But I think the project really has to start in kindergarten. It is a pedagogical project. It is a project of, of, of generating a sensibility and 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 the kind of living with this organizedness as a positive as something exciting as something that is not frightening but that um opens up what we can feel and what we can think and and so i think yes it is about how we are taught because i think before children are taught they actually that's why they have such a you know what we would call dreadful spatial awareness because to them things hang together very differently time hangs together very differently space hangs together very differently briefly i think teenagers get that again where it all goes a bit difficult but we consider that bad and we educate them to to work in lines and i think we lose a huge potential because they only listen to semantic sense and they hardly ever get to make sounds in schools at least the schools i have experienced and the education systems i know when if they could, you know, we could actually be more at ease with being in water, be more at ease in water as a metaphor and being in water as a as a way of thinking the world is connected and as relational and where maybe the knowledge we really need exactly right now, where we need to deal with really big global problems is not in either this discipline or that discipline or this discipline, but it's in between. And yet the in between is such a a difficult, difficult place for, for, for universities to grasp, for funders to grasp, um, for people to trust in. So I have no, no, I mean, apart from starting in kindergarten and hoping that a whole generation of new people will, will upset the university, I, I, I don't have an immediate solution. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. Um, um, I also have a question, um, Sebastian and um, Robert, and people please raise your hand if you have a question too. Um, in terms of, you know, I mean, the, t the kind of story that you were telling us about um, the history of the hydrophone and what it sort of created as a, kind of like as a byproduct in a way, right? The, the suddenly like discovering the sounds of whales and then kind of even scripting the whales or scoring the whales in a way and, and, and kind of transforming their sounds into something else. Um, in a way, is a wonderful example of, you know, a conundrum that we have as well right now, right? Which is that um, one of the problems of like climate change and, um, and, and science is the communicability of the data, right? And it seems that, you know, your suggestion here is that, that the um, combination of natural sciences with um, sound studies and sound art is a way of reaching that um, kind of level of communication and kind of creating maybe an empathic or effective connection that then sort of um, enables you to sort of look at things differently or acknowledge in a way the whale in, um, in a totally different way. Um, can you maybe expand on that or, or tell me that I'm wrong in, in how I've kind of summarized, you know? <laughs> Well, I, I would not say that you're wrong, um, but I, I, would, I would just stress that it's not a suggestion, it's just an observation, rather, that throughout the, the history of oceanic sciences, there has been some kind of outreach or some kind of, you know, it started with an idea of how could you, could you apply this knowledge to different kind of um, realms, for example. And it seems like with, um, um, with more political relevance, like climate political relevance of these um, um, of this research, they start to multiply efforts or other like stakeholders are coming in. It's not only like scientists looking for artists or public PR people in order to convey their messages. It's also rather that people jump on board literally and asking them to participate it's like they're becoming an object of like an, an object of um, ethnographic studies for example and it's more like like blurring boundaries or also yeah perhaps it's more like blurring boundaries and and multiplying um certain kind of approaches in order to spread the word to some degree and I don't think this is like an intentional kind of um, intentional um, effort or approach, but rather like a, a genealogy that cannot be stopped very easily. Because now you see there is funding for um, science and, and arts um, relationships or there are fellowships or kind of stuff like at the Max Planck Institutes, for example, in Germany and stuff. So it's, it, it is institutionalized already as some kind of interdisciplinary kind of work. And it's, it seems to me that um, art could have become some kind of an, an instrument in this kind of funding landscape at least in German um, academia, in order to, yeah, because there are some hopes, but I'm not quite sure what these hopes are, what they can do with that kind of yeah, artistic results then. But. Yeah, let me just uh, uh, jump in and uh, add uh, one example that would, uh, I would like to mention here. I put this uh, the link for all of you in the chat. So if we are uh, thinking about this, um, the uh, works that were mentioned here, uh, Hungry Listening and um, Pollution as Colonialism, it is obvious that we uh, also would have to situate the, um, the oceanic uh, sciences in a broader history of uh, techno scientific um, of, of the techno scientific complex, and as a um, non innocent technology, or the the hydro hydrophone as a non innocent uh, technology, as um, Donna Haraway perhaps uh, f would frame it. And there is an um, uh, an interesting film that I uh, wanted to point you to, which is called The Whale and the Raven. And um, it is about two uh, people who go um, uh, in, uh, I'm not sure 
on the west on the west or east coast of Canada, and they are uh, observing whales, but they do it from outside. So then they do not go into the water. They only have their microphones in there, um, observing orcas and other whale populations. And the um, the film is an interesting example of how these people um, that are amateur scientists uh, commence and begin to collaborate with indigenous populations because there is a plan to uh, to um, to build um, um, a gas uh, or an, a net uh, a, f a plant for liquefied uh, natural gas in the um, in a in a whale habitat near the coastal uh, area. So I mean that would that would be a kind of an interesting example to show how we can um, decolon decolon decolonize uh, sound studies and um, um, have um, yeah different perspective also in uh, in um, take them into account in this in this field of, of research and have this um, yeah the ocean as a sonic space uh, that is entangled with different um, mm -hmm. uh, not not to say entities but yeah people whales and uh, yeah geological um, materials but also perhaps just taking up Salome's point on, on how on the, let's say, critical potential of sound and studying sound. It seems like constructing the ocean as, an, as a sonic environment seems also very inviting for different um, participants, for different disciplines to jump in. As you could see at the paper that, that, that Robert, you were presenting the Duarte paper which uh, like a bunch of disciplines and even though including humanities and arts have been understood this kind of research as an, an, an invitation in order to collaborate with them. So I would be also, there, there are some, some hints at least how, the, how academia could have, uh, is changing just slightly over the years. If there are clusters of um, interdisciplinarity in Germany there and, 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 and if it becomes, becomes more common that also interdisciplinary teams, all, not only spreading like physics and biology, but also spreading the whole of academia spectrum um, could have been, yeah, I don't, I, I don't say that it's normal already or it's like common, but it, it, it's possible at least. And so perhaps like the more turns we have, the more interdisciplines, like Holger Schulze says, we have to establish and sound is just one of them and perhaps water can become the next one. Like. That sounds good. I, I, I like the I like the idea. Um, I think there's one final question from Steen. Um, and then um, I think we're also almost um, out of time uh, after that. Steen, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, um, it's a bit of a question and a comment. Uh, I have this book here, it's a great book. Um, here Where We Are by Michael Stoker. And there's one chapter where he uh, explains like uh, the hearing of especially cetaceans, but also many other uh, marine life is not like our hearing. It's basically a different way of being in their world, which is strange to us. And I was just asking, um, if perhaps listening without instrumentalizing it too much into science or for a specific art, but just being open and listening is a way of uh, connecting to a world which we don't know. Yes, we know water and we know which species live in there and we know uh, what the quality of the water is, but we, we can't experience what it means to live in that world. It's also slightly related to uh, the question of pollution, what is pollution, and to the uh, talk of Salome, of what is sound and how could it bring us um, into a thing that we don't know? Does somebody want to pick that up? We don't know what it actually feels like to listen like a whale. Yeah, I, see, I think the idea that we have to have not an instrumentalized listening, like, and that is exactly what I mean. In school, we learn to listen for the right answer, the right sentence construction, the right mathematical equation. And even if we learn an instrument, traditionally speaking, we learn to listen for the right harmonies, the right intervals, and the right sound. And this listening as a being with, open to 
whatever we might hear, whatever world we might hear, I think um, is is in a way, as you say, um, supposed to be, you know, um, maybe just just listening. But I think that just listening is what we are actually so bad at that we can't because we're so trained to make everything has to have a purpose and it makes sense. And I think that's where I have, you know, I have this hope for sonic fictions, for sonic possible worlds, for a, a, a phonocene, for, you know, these other worlds that we could imagine because it is so very difficult to imagine beside ourselves. Thank you. Let me, let me just quickly add that that of, of course, you know, it's perhaps it goes back to a very, very old phantasma of humankind that we could be able to transform into something else, right? So if you look at the cultural imaginarium, like uh, th this has a long history, like metamorphosis, for example, right? So, and, but, but I like the idea of the wish that lies behind it, right? This is the meaning, I guess, what Salome means that with this kind of opening up and, and like, or exploring, like, even though it is not possible to 100%, it's like getting closer, not, not close, but it's trying to do it, right? It's trying to irritate yourself by tr listening to the world or to your habitat as a penguin, for example. And I'm not a friend of saying, well, this is only limited to sound. You can also like use visual filters in order to, to look um, in, and to, to like like a, like a tiger, for example, right? So it's there is a chance of this of this will to be become post anthropocentric, which is multiplying the, the the possibilities of our perception. And it's on the same page, like the inverse part of the of the coin, is that by that we recognize our own bio media limitedness of our perception. And this is criticizing the whole epistemological basis, which is like in this kind of reciprocal relationship to that. And I guess this is the only chance by like this, this disorienting, disturbing our perception by such means, for example, and they can be technical or they can be just like um, imaginative uh, traveling, for example. But by that we can work back to the more what they what could be called more abstract notions of um, how we make sense of the world. Yes, so it's not an answer, <laughs> but it's like more more or less like a hope that that is not it's not meaningless to try to think differently and try to by trying to listen differently. Um, I guess there was one kind of um, comment in the chat to um, your sense of metamorphosis, Sebastian, saying like in how far technology isn't really the, is that not really the core tool that would make that happen? By, by, by technology, mm -hmm. I mean, um, well, it's, well, even, even though we are, Robert and I, we're working at the, the, <laughs> at the uh, Humboldt University, like in the old Kittlerian kind of rooms, perhaps, um, I would not buy into like a media a priori of this is, this is the game changer for all that could happen. That's why I would, would like to stress that it's also possible by just by, by imagining different stuff it's not only that we depend on technology to do all this and i'm not quite sure if this is more it's like transferring our responsibility on to like technology or others in order to instrumentalize what we should be responsible ourselves does that make sense yeah um i think <laughs> Arsu has like a, he was one that was asking the question and um, uh, has another question back. You want to? Um, hi, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, hi, I, Arsu. Uh, hi. Uh, I thought that was like just kind of a following association of like what you were saying and that if technology can help us with this metamorphosis, uh, with this metamorphosis, because indeed, like when listening and thinking about microphones as, of course, the technology that they are bringing us much closer to any kind of other worldly listening. And then whatever speakers we use, whatever headphones we use, bringing us closer to that. 
in that term, but then also in another term of, for example, um, yeah, just helping us uh, sort of um, expand our sensibilities or our yeah, um, wahrnehmung, uh, um, kind mm -hmm. of uh, the perceptions in a multisensorial way. Also, sort of this, yeah, I don't know, um, uh, classic thing: our glasses or hearing aids. Or um, if you want to go one more step, there is this one visual artist who has this like sensor. I'm sure everybody knows about him, but I forgot his name. Who has this sensor attached that? Uh, bring sounds to his um to, that brings sounds of colors to his brain so he has a completely different perception when he goes through you know an environment because the sounds are triggered or like yeah sounds are triggered in his brain according to the colors that he sees because he doesn't see it really it's really just like sensor camera mm -hmm. and that kind of makes a different being already in that in that sense so I mean, it's not particularly a question, <laughs> but more of like a associative curiosity. Sorry to extend, but couldn't help myself than jumping in. But thanks. Yeah. That was great. So, I, 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 thank you, Arsu. I, I didn't mean that that technology cannot help by doing this, but it's not, but we just need to be careful not stressing the point too much or overload technology with these wish, wishes that in the end just you know pushing the responsibility for things away like waiting for new technology to save the world kind of this is what i wanted to to say and 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 i guess if by by defining what technology means or media means for example rather then and 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 using all that's what what i would we call biomedia our like bio media our um, constitution like what what eyes ears what else um, and 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 skin is already kind of a mediator between something like the self and our and 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 our environments. So these other things are just like working with that in common, right? And then we don't make up hierarchies between us as human entities and the media as something different. Mm -hmm. um, Magomed, you also have a question. Do you wanna... Yes, I would like to comment when you said uh, that uh, we cannot really experience uh, life underwater, but uh, what do you think about uh, the people who dive underwater with uh, oxygen and uh, they actually make documentary movies about uh, trying to live with fish, etc. They, You can see them diving very deep underwater and uh, basically touching, living among fish, etc. What do you think about that? Does that go for me, Mago mate? Or was it for all of us? For all of you, like when you said uh, yeah. you couldn't really experience life underwater, but I believe uh, with modern technology like submarines, etc. and yeah. diving deep underwater with oxygen tanks, you mm -hmm. can actually experience this kind of underwater life. You can observe and touch uh, the underwater uh, fish, for example. Yeah, yeah. of course, you can experience an underwater life, but it is always your personal life. I just wanted to stress the point that the idea of becoming a fish is something like a, is a, is a phantasma, which is, which is nice and important, but it's, it, it, there is always a gap that we cannot really become a fish, but we can get closer. We can get into that. We can try to how do you call it? attune us to these kind of environmental um, um, relations that other species have by, for example, technological means of yeah, living or staying underwater very long. But it's not like a metamorphosis, a complete metamorphosis. I, if I may quickly jump in, I, I actually think the issue for me certainly is not about becoming fish or becoming anything else, because I feel there's a huge danger of a hyper anthropocentrism where we just sort of, you know, like in children's book where we over over identify and we think, oh, now the rock can speak because I can hear it or the tree can speak. And I don't think that is at all. Um, I mean, I, I find that potentially a little bit dangerous. And I also don't think I don't think when you go diving in a suit uh, with an oxygen tank, 
you live like a fish. I mean, I just don't think so. And, and that's why I also, for me, actually the imagination and the thinking of it while you're doing your water gymnastics or your swimming is almost more valuable because it's not about becoming, for me, it's, I'm not at all a Deleuzean and it's not at all about becoming the other, which I see as a colonial um, um, taking over of a body, um, uh, of an animal or of an object or of whatever it is, but more about um, the disorientation that we spoke about earlier and and and, and the pluralizing of, of, of how we are together. So I know, I know that obviously I can only be I, you know, that's that funny thing when you look into the mirror and you think, why am I I? And you do this a hundred times and you go really, really dizzy because that is truly the only position I can have. But what I can decide is where I end, where I end in terms of empathy and understanding and, and working with and being with. And, but I think in all of this out reaching out to, we also have to understand the responsibility of our limitation. Um, as a real ethical responsibility, I cannot pretend I understand fish or start to speak for them. I think that would become very, very dangerous. Just the last sentence, sorry, but I, yeah. I need to say that because that, that's the difference. If you, if you mentioned Deleuze, then the difference to so that is the Derridarian or Derridarian um, idea of, of how incorporating the others by not incorporating it, right? This is the ethical dimension that perhaps you have also um, 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 try to to bring on um, on the table, Ramona, and that you, Salome, are working on, right? As I, as far as I understood you, this is was what I was had in mind by not becoming a fish. But how can we just make sense and get to the other? How is this dialectical kind of in, um, yeah, not appropriation but dialectical constellation, um, working of the othering, always taking part in the constitution of I as myself. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Um, I will actually borrow the, um, um, the words of somebody else to end this. And it's one of the people in the chat because she posed a wonderful question that is um, maybe not to be answered, but is more um, a way of practicing something differently and, and opening up to, um, um, to new perspectives. And this is Felicia and she asks, I love switching. So her question is, what does water know about you that you don't know about yourself? So that is all for you um, to answer as you um, leave this um, session and find answers to, but I think it's um, a nice way of kind of thinking about that, approaching of the other rather than um, becoming the other. Um, all right, thank you everyone for hanging in there. Um, we really ran over time. Thank you everybody for wonderful performances and presentations and discussions and for the sort of openness of exchange. Um, and um, we are working on further iterations of this seminar or um, kind of um, other forms of um, reading groups, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're interested, please reach out to us and we will reach out to you with further updates if you are on our mailing list. Okay, dokie. Thank you so much, Salome. Thank you so much, Tomoko. Thank you so much, Sebastian and Robert. This was truly fascinating and a wonderful end to our first um, kind of uh, triplet of, um, of sessions. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Um, Bye-bye. Thank you so much. It was great to be here. Yay. Exchange ideas with you. Also from my side, all to all the participants and questions. Lovely. <laughs>